good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us and uh, welcome to the AI real time and uh, IoT uh, track. I am uh, Ralu Kanagu. I am the marketing director of Big Step, and I will be your host for today. Um, I'm quite excited to be here with you today because both AI and uh, I IoT are somehow uh, my passions. So as they are connected to big data, it's somehow a match made in heaven. <clears throat> Anyhow, let's get down uh, to business. I would like to uh, introduce the first presentation. It's actually a joint presentation by Miranda Sharp and Matthias Schorer. So please, let's welcome them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming to the presentation. Um, I will introduce Miranda in a minute, so she gets her own little drum roll and everything. Um, so why are we here today? Um, this is a big data conference, right? And uh, what we see is that in, in what's happening now is that a lot of this data is actually coming out of things which haven't been there before or things which, which have been there but nobody ever cared about the data which they create and this is now changing. And so this is the reason why, why we are here to talk about this and um, also to talk about this whole Internet of Things um, idea. Now, depending on, on which analyst you ask, you get different numbers. Um, but they have one thing in common, they're all big, right? So they say that $255 billion are spent on IoT, and of course VMware wants to have a, a share of this, so that's why we are in this place. And I don't know whether you have seen that or heard it. Um, we've just announced on, announced on Tuesday that we are going to spend a billion dollars on, on actually developing the IoT business of Dell and VMware together. Um, to even give uh, our customers more options in that area. Now, <clears throat> Forbes says that companies are actually doing IoT because they, they hope that they will increase their revenue by 27%, right? Otherwise, nobody would invest in, into anything if you don't get anything out of it. And um, there are supposed to be 15 billion things connected. Now, this is a ridiculous number, and I hope every one of you know that, because they are not going to be connected together, right? But they are just around there, and some of them will be connected to a data center in maybe an automotive company, and others are connected to a data center in a healthcare organization, and hopefully they never have to talk to each other. But it's just a lot of things. And um, so we saw these numbers, and about one and a half or two years ago, we asked McKinsey to actually do a survey with our customers and ask them, so why are you doing IoT? Rather than thinking up a solution and then hoping that it's a good thing for our customers, we actually asked someone to interview our customers. And I have a few examples um, what came back. So the first one, um, which I find personally very interesting, is that in hospitals, um, every year 30% of the medical devices get lost. So they're not, of course, they're not losing an X-ray machine or MRT. They are far too big. Um, but they're losing scalpels, sometimes in patients, but sometimes also just they get lost or blood pressure meters. And the most famous things are wheelchairs. They get lost constantly, right? Um, and if you sum that all up, it's actually very expensive what you're losing over the year. I spoke to a hospital in Italy a few months ago, and they just over a weekend lost 70,000 euros in medical equipment. Now, that's Italy for you, but the point is, usually these things just get misplaced or thrown away by accident. They're not really stolen or anything. So if you would be able to track these things, that would be really cool, right? And it's also about tracking people, so tracking patients and tracking doctors and nurses to know where they are. So in case of, of an emergency, you really find the people who are nearest to the place where you need to treat that patient who just came in. So it's all interesting things, and it actually improves the life of, of the patients in healthcare. So that's a very interesting 
uh, and, and I think also rewarding example, what you can do with big data and big data analytics. Um, <clears throat> the other, um, well, actually our customers fear that quite a bit. They say that there's so much data being created, how should we handle it, right? And <clears throat> so in a production floor on a manufacturing side, up to a petabyte of data can be created every day. And <clears throat> don't get me wrong, that has always been created, just nobody really cared about it. So every machine is creating data. Every, um, <clears throat> every assembly line is creating data, but usually that's just thrown away. So now people come along and say, oh, Industry 4.0, we want to have all that data, run it through our big data analytics, and then do great things with it. And so suddenly you have to get that data into a central place. And then you find out, oops, it's quite a lot of data. So for VMware, this is obviously driving uh, what we call our vSAN business or virtual SAN business, right? Because you need to store that data somewhere. And last but not least, we have our fantastic uh, connected cars, and Miranda can talk about that in a minute too. Um, so, 280 million connected vehicles. That means that basically every single manufacturer of cars will have a few million new cars every year which send their data to their data center. Right? A connected car, just one, creates about a terabyte of data every day. And you have to keep that for 20 years. And you have not only one car, but a million running. So that, that's, that's what I would say, big data on steroids. That, that brings you into the terabyte and exabyte area very easily. You have to handle that somehow. Right? What VMware is doing in this business is actually helping car manufacturers to get that data out of the cars and to also send software updates to the cars. Right? This is what we do in that area. Now, so all very interesting examples and they have one thing in common which is management and security. Right? You need to manage all these devices which are out there and you do need to make sure that whatever happens on, the, on them is really secure. <clears throat> and this is the, the business uh, VMware is in, obviously. Um, now, asking the customers what is actually driving them to do all these things, <clears throat> there are four major areas which we got back. The one, and the, the most important one, is customer experience. I just spoke about that hospital, right, which is losing devices, but they're also losing patients, and not because they're dying, because they get lost inside the hospital. And once that happens, um, they need to search for them, right, because they could have had a heart attack and they're lying somewhere, right? So suddenly you have nurses and doctors searching for patients who actually should do something else. Right? So being able to track a patient would be a really cool experience, not only for the patient, um, but also for the nurses and the doctors to be really able to find that person quickly. Or another thing which is important, if you're in a hospital and you have to go through several different tests, like they take your blood sample, they do your blood pressure, they put you uh, into an X-ray and maybe an MRT. Usually you do that by sequence, right? So, and most of the time you spend waiting in a hospital, right? Now, if they would know that until your blood sample can be taken, it takes another half an hour, but the MRT is free at the moment, they could route you to the MRT first. And so shorten the time which you spent waiting and make better use of that very expensive equipment. That's a very interesting use case is there. So customer experience. The next thing, and every good slide needs to have the agility word on them, so that's why I have that as well. Um, agility in that term means that um, IoT projects today, they are all usually bespoke and it takes a long time to ramp them up. So 
instead of being able to say, okay, we have a security camera, let's hook that up and do something great with the data, usually you go through all the loops of how do we make this secure, how do we connect it, how do we manage it, and then tomorrow someone comes along and says, we have a great people detector in the ceiling, uh, can we hook that up? And you go again through the same loop, so it takes a long time. Um, now, if we could shorten that cycle, that would be really cool. That's what our customers said. Automation and improving business processes. So, going back to the hospital, right, to have this, this sequence of doing tests in a shorter time would be obviously an improved business process. But we also talk about other, uh, other areas like in manufacturing. So, we're not talking about automating a single machine, but we talk about having the whole, the whole manufacturing process, including all the suppliers, uh, brought together in a more automated fashion. And to do that, you need to connect all these different devices, all these different machines, and bring the data into a central location. And this is what we can help with. And last but not least, connecting people and things. Um, if you know that a machine is going to have a problem in two weeks' time because of a bearing is, is, is bearing out, or um, a jet turbine needs to be serviced sooner than you thought, then you obviously can improve um, the way people work with these things, can improve also security in many cases. So that's why our, our customers said these are the, the four areas they really need to look into uh, when they think about IoT. And then they said, but um, somehow security needs to be woven into that all because otherwise we start over and over again to think about how do we secure this security camera? How do we secure this machine? How do we secure this oil rig? Right? Because one thing is clear, IoT is not similar to what we do in the data center. Right? It's two very different areas where the people in the data center, they know everything about security, how to prevent breaches, how to uh, software update things regularly. The OT people, and that's the people who are outside, uh, they, don't, they hate software updates because every time they have to stop their machines, um, they basically don't want to know anything about security because it just prevents them from doing cool stuff. And we have to bring that somehow together, right? And this is, is the, the mission we set out to, to fulfill. And again, it's all about a ton of data which you need to transport, a ton of data which you have to evaluate. <coughs> and if anyone knows about big data, then that's obviously the British Ordnance Survey who do the maps. And Miranda is uh, telling you more about that, what you guys are doing in that area. People quite often ask me when I come to a big data conference, what are you doing here? Which I point out is quite an existentialist question for a mapping company. Um, uh, uh, and um, you know, how, how did you get here and things like that. Um, the things that you might not know uh, about Ordnance Survey uh, is that we were the first national mapping agency to digitize. Until very recently, we had the largest geospatial database in the world. Um, which, when you consider our relative land mass, is quite surprising, and in fact, the stability of our borders. Um, we are 200 years old. Uh, we were conceived at a time uh, when we were simultaneously worried about the, Span uh, the French and the Scots. Uh, you'll notice that time has moved on significantly. Um, and, um, uh, and, but, but now, um, we, we, we're, worried, we're worried and thinking about um, how, in this new world of technology, um, we, we make more sense of it all, and you may have heard the word digital twin. Uh, so in the beginning, um, 200 years ago, we produced beautiful paper maps. Um, uh, now we are very much concerned uh, with uh, accuracy. So I have a, a lovely colleague who in the early 80s was sent to survey bits of Scotland, which he did faithfully. Um, on this bit of Scotland, there wasn't a great deal there. Um, uh, so he surveyed the pylons faithfully. He went back a few years later, because we were terribly efficient at the time, uh, to resurvey this bit of Scotland, and was horrified to discover that the pylons that he so faithfully represented were in the wrong place. So he rang head office and said, what on earth are you doing? And they said, well, 
it's much more pleasing on the eye if the corner pylons, you know, the ones where the wires change direction are in the right place, and then we just space the ones in between evenly. You know, and that tells you exactly where we came from. You know, it was about beauty, it wasn't about accuracy. Now it's all about accuracy, don't worry. If you're running a mountain rescue, you'll be quite safe in Scotland. Um, but uh, it, now it is about producing machine-readable data uh, for a very different world. Um, and and the, 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 the quality that Ordnance Survey has uh, that a lot of mapping agencies around the world aren't yet blessed with is the interoperability, the interoperable nature of our data. Uh, so that you can ask um, our data the question, what's the average size of a front garden? Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the distance to duct um, for your utility network? Um, where, where's the flood water going to go? Um, and uh, because our, late, our data all stands up on one on one spatial referencing framework, that's the end of my geography lesson, I don't know any more than that, um, th then we we're able to ask our data that type of question. And clever companies like Space Syntax, which are a, a spin out of the Bartlett School in London, can do this kind of analysis. Um, this is looking at the highways network of Great, of, uh, Great Britain and working out to the most connected streets. So how, how many other places you can get to from a single place. So Oxford Street is the hottest street uh, in the UK. That's a good thing um, because it means you go along it uh, to get to different places, but you also cross it and go, and, and go through it. Um, and uh, well-designed networks have a combination of hot and cold streets. Uh, so they're doing some work in Saudi Arabia that says, you know, if, you have, if everything's hot, um, then people have nowhere to escape to and commerce doesn't flourish. Um, the other thing that this analytics supports is that the heat of your street at different distances, so how many other streets you can get to within 10 kilometres or 30 kilometres or 50 kilometres, will correlate with different things. So it might correlate with land use um, and even with GVA. Um, but I can, I can talk more about, not much more about that, but I can talk more about that and put you in the direction of the people who do that kind of analytics using place now. Um, but the, the, the sort of the future world for us uh, is, is in the Internet of Things space. That's relief, talking about Internet of Things. And we're doing some work with Innovate UK and 27 partners in the Oxford Road uh, corridor of Manchester, uh, where they are instrumenting the city uh, for, the, for the benefit of its citizens and, it bus and its businesses. Um, so we went up there uh, 18 months ago uh, and through all the map making technology you could, uh, we collected, and in a 2.3 square hectare area, we collected in a, de a detail about additional 40,000 assets. Um, that's a, that's a, a, a asset, an additional asset classes of 200 that we'd never touched before. So that is things like parking restrictions, um, CCTV cameras, uh, um, bollards, cycle lanes, the lot, everything to which you might append an IoT sensor. Um, and we did that so that the partners we're working with can make sense of the data, the, sort of the tsunami of the data that's overcoming them, um, and deliver real-based human use cases uh, for the, the university, the hospitals, um, and the citizens of Manchester. Um, I, just one, my favourite use case, which illustrates uh, the beauty and the complexity of the damn thing. Um, think about all the bodies who are involved in delivering the benefits that come from this, the talking bus stop. Um, this is a bus stop to which you go and you can check in. Uh, and uh, so that means that you can send granny or your child um, to the bus stop and they know that you know they got there safely, uh, therefore increasing the autonomous use of the vulnerable, uh, the, sorry, the autonomous range of the vulnerable. The bus company can, very, can have um, a retrospective view of what normal is, so it sends the right size vehicle down on the mornings when there's a market, after a significant weather event um, or after, just after the hours changed. Uh, in the event of an emergency, um, you, you can understand, you've got intelligent muster points that tell people where to go or where not to go and, and how to act. And even b because of the unique way that Manchester has a, its governance regime where these, the council has responsibility for public health uh, as well as infrastructure, they've, they can start gaming with their population and say, the next bus isn't going to be here for 20 minutes. If you walk for 10 minutes, you will be healthier, there will be less congestion, and we might even take money off your bus fare. So that's the kind of exciting thing um, that enables the building up of social capital, which we, we see in other areas, uh, for which um, I IoT uh, will enable. Because very often we see um, technology push projects without the, uh, the societal pull 
uh, that we might require. I'm not going to talk about these now, but they in, said she, and then she's going to. Um, so in, in Boston, you can adopt a fire hydrant, clear snow away from it, and that means that uh, you get you get best Boston Red Sox tickets, um, and, the fire, and the fire authority doesn't waste money um, clearing your fire hydrant. Uh, people love it, um, and uh, and the the underground map, which is um, a representation of data. Uh, it's not a map, uh, but it, because the, the, all this data is all very well, but you need to represent it in a way uh, that makes sense to the people for whom you're serving. So I'm handing back to you now, aren't I, to, 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 to actually to talk about real time and let's talk about people. use cases. Yeah, more. let's talk about people. Thank you, Miranda. So when we have all this data, right, um, you can do amazing things with it. Um, and, and, and one... One topic we hear very often is really improving city operations, right? Because every one of us has been in a traffic jam, every one of us has been searching for parking space. And um, there are many new methods now which you can actually use to, to make these parking spaces more visible, uh, to make it clear where they are and how long they might be occupied. And for that, obviously, you have to, to have sensors in the, in, in, either in the road or you have them in traffic lights. And um, so there are sensors now which you can actually bury in, in just in the, in the road and they last for 10 years, right? They have a battery and they, they send information and they need so much, so uh, that incredible less low power that they can just last for 10 years. The problem is the battery will run out eventually and you should know about that, right? And so um, <clears throat> it's a good thing to monitor the health of these devices and that, that's one area where, where we are in uh, with VMware to be able to actually tell you about the, the underlying infrastructure which you need to get all that information out of your roads, out of your traffic lights, and all, out of these hundreds and thousands of devices which Miranda has, has uh, mentioned, and make sure that they're still working. And if they are going to be not working, you should know in advance. Another area is the, just the security aspects, so security cameras, closed circuit TVs, and we're working with a very interesting company. Um, they're called V5 Systems. They're a startup from, from um, the US, from California, and they have autonomous cameras. What do I mean by autonomous? Well, these cameras are not connected to the power grid and they're not connected to a network, but they're literally using solar and wind energy to be powered up. And they have all the complete compute on board. So the camera itself is really a smart device. And the camera decides whether there is something it should report on. That means if someone is walking into a fenced off area, um, there are crazy use cases like counting bald eagles in a, in, a, in a nature preserve where they put these cameras onto a tree and every time a bald eagle flies through, they count them. Or um, another use case, which is in university campuses, um, that they detect sprayers, right? So when do the spray can guys usually work? In the middle of the night when it's very quiet, right? When they start to, to shake that spray can, that is a very distinctive noise. And these cameras have, have microphones, so they detect this noise and then they would actually turn the angle and triangulate, and then they, 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 they then send an SMS or a signal to an authority who then come and um, hopefully arrest that guy who is spraying a wall. Um, they can do the same with someone yelling for help, of course. And they can also detect chemicals in the air and other things. Now the problem with these cameras, because they're autonomous, you cannot really just manage them as you would manage a normal camera. And so that's when, when we came in uh, at VMware and they use, they use something we call Pulse IoT Center, which is actually able to monitor devices which are not constantly connected and still give you all the necessary information about how long does that battery of that camera last? Is the wind, wind energy enough to charge the camera? Is the, that computer in there up and running? And all these different things. So very, very interesting use cases. So that's, that's uh, what VMware has bringing to the table in terms of IoT, which we call um, the Pulse IoT Center, which actually 
covers all these different areas I've been talking about before. How do you manage these things out there? How do you know that they are really still, still healthy? How do you secure them? And how in the end you get all that information which Miranda needs in her, in her systems out of these various devices into a central location. And um, this is very different from VMware has done so far because most of you probably know VMware out of the data center. And now we are outside the data center and doing all these great things. So I hope that what was interesting for you and also see how these puzzle pieces fall together. And uh, I think we're open for questions now, if there are any. For Miranda or for me. No questions. Hmm. I have a question for you, Miranda. Um, what do people think about security? In terms of are they worried about the data of them getting out and uh, being, being used in different spaces? Security and privacy. Yeah, security uh, and privacy. So security, privacy and value probably are the trium triumvirate. Um, and I hear more about the latter two than the first one. Um, I think if you crack the first two, you probably got the first one right. Um, so we we hear uh, because a lot of uh, location can often be the key that unlocks your identity. Um, you can know an awful lot about a person, but once you know, once you've located one of those bits of data in space, um, then you, then you then you, you then you unwittingly know a great deal. Um, uh, and the other problem we see, particularly in the um, in the autonomous vehicle space is um, the, there's an unstoppable force and an immovable object. Uh, so the, the vehicles, um, all the vehicle manufacturers and operating system leaders um, are, are not giving away their data. You know, the, the data is theirs, they're, they're, they're claiming to be worried about security and privacy, um, but they are seeking to monetize the data for which the vehicle is going to produce. Uh, whereas uh, the, the, the council, which might be running the infrastructure, is under pressure to give away its data, to, to make its data open. Um, and I suspect those two positions can't exist um, on their own anymore, mm -hmm. or for very, very long. On that point, do you see that becoming more regulated? I mean, we're, we're just going through the process now of financial mm -hmm. institutions being forced to make that data open. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a pretty similar parallel, isn't it? Uh, so my problem with open data is that people spell it F-R-E-E. -E. Um, uh, so it's, it's not about making it open, it's about making it shareable and connectable and discoverable. Um, and that process is not without cost. Um, so uh, the work we're doing uh, with the UK government is saying that there's, there's a level of data which is public good um, so that is you know, so when a sinkhole opens up in the middle of somewhere, how do you stop all the cars just driving lemming-like into it? Um, and so there's, there's, there has to be a rapid exchange of information, which is open um, but may not be free. Um, uh, on top of which, uh, you know, so and then you know, Apple might find you the best route or the most scenic route, um, and Porsche might fly you out of it, or um, or an alternative. So I, I think. Um, we will see a maturing of the attitude. So TfL are no longer making their data open in to the same extent they were. Um, so TfL make their data open so that we become more intelligent consumers, so that we walk instead of spending a stupid amount of time on the tube. Um, uh, and that they've got real data assets and it's no longer tenable for public services to do it. So I, I think I've fudged around your question, but you know, sort yeah, of I, open. I guess I was just wondering if you're going to get to the level of governance and compliance yeah. that a financial institution has, because the, the data's not dissimilar, is it? Yeah. It's very private. And they're forced to do it. They have no choice. And, but that's one industry. So yeah. how do you regulate that? Because what you've been talking about is dozens of industries. It, precisely. Um, I, and I think the, the governance will always lack behind the technology. Uh, and so, I don't know, what do you think the best answer to that question is? I, I'm not sure we've really realised what's yeah. the implications. I mean, you're talking about some heavy duty implications, and, but there's probably dozens and dozens more that we haven't even thought of yet. Mm -hmm. How, what do we do when autonomous vehicle algorithms are different and offer a competitive advantage? Do I buy the car that's less likely to slam me into a wall yeah. and avoid someone or more and, likely and kill to? The child. <laughs> yeah, so do I hit the children or go off the cliff? Yes, yeah, so you can upgrade Turn now. the dial to 
Uh, yes, I think uh, we are on that journey. A, a bit of an open question to the both of you. Aside from self-driving cars, is there another technology that this Internet of Things and open data and large amounts of data will enable in the coming years that you're excited about? Um, you want to answer that? I can Should have a quick, I? You, you go first. I go first. Well, I think uh, it's, it's definitely around uh, making people's lives easier or better. I mean, there's so many different areas. I spoke about uh, the parking, but it's also, especially, uh, I think about healthcare, where we see, we'll see a lot of improvements. And um, also, in fact, in building management. Uh, every one of you probably has been in a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting room where after five minutes you were really feeling sweaty and, and somehow uh, um, maybe tired. That's because the CO2 levels in that room just go up and they're just not built the way they should be. And you can do a lot of good things with sensors in the ceiling and making these environments better. And I mean, we all work in our offices for most, the largest part of our, of our daily life. So um, to making these spaces a better place I think is a very exciting uh, view on, on IoT, which happens pretty soon. Yeah, I think driverless cars is the, bit, is the one that everybody gets excited about because they can, they can picture it. Oh. Um, uh, and we have, a, and, but the, uh, the best use cases in IoT tend to be quite businessy and you know, sort of Monday morning more than Friday afternoon. Uh, I, 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 wait, I wait and see. Okay. Thank you very much. And we are still there to answer questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>